Hello. Hello. And again, hello. Who is saying hello again? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Good evening. Uh, wonderful crowd. Looks like a lot of energy in the room. Uh, welcome to the 2024 Wilma Diamond Stokely Memorial Lecture presented by the Friends of the Knox County Public Library. Applause. And by the John C. Hodges Society of the University of Tennessee Libraries. This crowd's going to be wonderful, Carolyn. Uh, they're on it. Uh, but they have one more test coming up. Uh, my name is Jim Stokely. I'm one of I'm one of two sons of James Stokely and Wilma Dyckman Stokely. I'm a member of the John C. Hodges Society Board, and I'm president of something called the Wilma Dyckman Legacy, a, a small nonprofit public charity in Asheville, headquartered in Asheville. So I'm here tonight to do three things. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you two or three jokes. <laughs> and the second, I'm going to say a word about Wilma Dyckman. And thirdly, I'm going to introduce our speaker for the evening. So I am maybe the shortest sentence in the English language. I do maybe the longest sentence. <laughs> They're already turning on me. We're, we're going to get to that. You turned on me last year, too. Uh, yesterday, I sent my brother a Get Better Soon card. He's not sick. I just think he could be better. <laughs> no, nah, that was good. That's a good joke right there. Uh, so lastly, uh, today is an interesting day. Uh, you know, I, I said last year that I was going to retire. You turned on me in my third joke. And I said I'm going to retire from being a comedian. And uh, I was correct, but I, I had in mind 365 days of retirement. Today is leap day. It's like purge day. You can do anything you want to on leap day. So, uh, so about an hour ago, I, I took up my position uh, on the sidewalk in front of the History Center I started asking people, I said, were you born on February 29th? Were you born on February 29th? Couldn't find anybody except this one uh, elderly lady with a walker. She's pushing it across the sidewalk. I said, were you born on February 29th? She said, yes. I said, well, how old are you? She said, I'm 88. I said, no, you're not. You're 22. You've had four, uh, you've had 22 birthdays your entire life. She uh, looked at me, she, she pulled herself straight up on her walk and looked me in the eye. She said, Sonny, when I was 22, the Tennessee River was flowing toward the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> That's all I got, folks. That's it. Then I'll be back next year. Um, word about Wilma Dykeman. The Wilma Dykeman Legacy is an organization that sponsors events and activities which sustain uh, the values for which Wilma Dykeman stood, environmental integrity, social justice, and the power of the written and spoken word. Each year, the, this memorial lecture is an opportunity for book lovers and library supporters of our region to come together not only in celebration of Wilma Dykeman as an extraordinary individual, but in support of her core values of environmental and social justice. So in 13 words, the legacy promotes environmental and social justice through the written and spoken word. Wilma once said, quotes, how we treat the land reflects how we treat people. Yes! <laughs> in 1957, she wrote in her and my father's award-winning book, Neither Black Nor White, quotes, as we have misused our richest land, we have misused ourselves. As we have wasted our bountiful water, we have wasted ourselves. As we have diminished the lives of one whole segment of our people, we have diminished ourselves. So the third thing I'm going to do tonight is introduce our wonderful speaker. And uh, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Carolyn Finney. 
Dr. Finney is a storyteller, author, and cultural geographer who is passionate in areas related to identity, creativity, and resilience. She works to develop cultural awareness regarding the environment, and she seeks to ensure that diverse groups are represented in environmental policies and decisions. Dr. Finney's experience backpacking across the world and her time living in Nepal led her to complete a BA and an MBA focused on gender and environmental issues. She went on to earn a PhD focused on African Americans and environmental issues in the United States. Alongside writing and public speaking, Dr. Finney is the Environmental Studies Professor of Practice at Middlebury College. The difference between a professor and a professor of practice is that a professor of practice has actually done something in their life. <laughs> That's not in the biographical remarks. She has also been a Fulbright Scholar and has served on the U.S. National Parks Advisory Board for the National Park Service. Her first book, published in 2014, is on sale in the back corner uh, called Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans in the Great Outdoors, and will be on sale following, uh, following the talk uh, in the back of the room. So before you leave the building, uh, need, you need to get your money out ready to spend. Uh, no Dr. Pressure. Finney, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Uh, Dr. Finney, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. We're honored to have you as our guest speaker. We look forward to hearing about a topic that was dear to Wilma Dykeman. Everyone, Dr. Carolyn Finney. I want some more of those jokes. Um, Thank you. It's so funny seeing people I haven't seen in a long time. I went to grad school with this guy, and I haven't seen him in years, and his mom. I didn't go to grad school with her, but it was almost like I went to grad school with these. I mean, they were there. It's so cool when I come places and I run into people I don't expect to see that I know before. Um, I got so many things to say. I got notes, and the first thing you'll know about me is I don't really pay any attention to them. But they're meant to try to keep me on li in line. Um, Thank you for inviting me here today. And you know, whenever I'm invited in particular, because it's honoring someone who's doing work, I love the idea that, you know, that's why I had to say something about if we diminish, if we treat the land badly, we treat the people badly, if we treat anybody badly, we're all diminished. And that's how I kind of understand that and heard that. So I feel honored that I can kind of share my little story with you um, to honor that. Um, I always think about where I'm, you can, somebody can ask me about why I'm, I entitled this, but I'm not going to, you can't hear me? Oh my God. Well. <laughs> so sorry. That's okay. This is, this is the reality. This is like, you know, Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. You're kind of seeing how it really works. I'm so sorry. And, no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> there, there I am. There That's you are. Right. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that's kind of freaking me out. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to stand away from this. I'm going to do this. I'm not sure why this is here, but I'm going to move this too. I didn't mean to turn it off. It should have just gone to the next slide. I'm not sure what happened. Where's the fabulous Beth? Oh. All right, excellent. Yeah, Oops. that's all right. Let's go back. So what I write here in my notes, so I want to start, sort of start off with this. I always try to think where am I going to start with pe when people ask me to come in and talk, to talk about black faces and white spaces. So this is the 10-year anniversary of me writing that book, and I've written other things since. No more books yet. I'm working on a second one now, but I've written other things since, but it's interesting for me to think about all the time that's gone by since then. So I read an article in the Washington Post a couple of months ago, and there was a UPenn professor, um, his name is Jonathan Zimmerman. Uh, he was, it, was a, it was a conversation in an article about race, and he said, quote, most of our prior arguments were about who to include in the story, not the story itself. America has lost a shared national narrative. I disagree with him <laughs> so much. And what I disagree with is the idea that there was ever a shared national narrative. I think there's a dominant narrative, which I don't think is incorrect, but I think it's highly incomplete. 
And when we're talking about the environment, um, that's what I want to talk about today, how I think it's incomplete and why it matters. And how do we attend to a different story or a different set of stories that are out there? I always have to put up, you can't hear me anymore, and I'm not sure what happened. You can, where, where's the magic lady? <laughs> All right, I don't know what happened, but the mic went away. So I'm gonna talk really loudly <laughs> to the best of my ability. Um, well, save your voice, wait till you get help. <laughs> well. Well, I'm holding so many things. I can try it. Yes. Oh, I'm a, oh wait a minute. Hi, my best friend. I don't know what's happening. It doesn't like me. So I usually put the slide up here. I'm just going to keep talking. Right, the one about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I need new batteries, and that's like deep and metaphorical. Uh, that's not the one I meant to show you yet. But we're going to go backwards to this one. So, whenever I talk, I want to talk about this question of story and dominant narratives. And oh, I get my batteries replaced. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's okay. Uh, I lose my way. So, for me, even what I'm talking about is always related. It's always in context. And I think about the stories of now. And I created this slide maybe three or four years ago, right when COVID was in place. I tended to. When George Floyd was murdered, when Christian Cooper had his skin weaponized, when he walked into Central Park, I suddenly had more work than ever before. And so that's really complicated. I was really grateful for that. I live in Burlington, Vermont. I live by myself in a small apartment. I tend to travel around a lot. I like to talk, which you can tell already. Um, but I was engaging virtually all the time. I mean, I must have spoken and consulted and advised with hundreds of people in the last three or four years alone. right? And I was really grateful to have that work. I was also emotionally exhausted. Um, and I was wondering what would happen in terms of the ebb and flow and the way that we move. And at the time when I created this slide, the only thing I had up there was um, a map of the United States, a political map of the United States. I had the image of George Floyd, and I had COVID. And uh, about a week or two ago, I realized I had to update it a little bit. And I'm not going to talk about these issues, but I had to make sure you know that I know they're also happening at the same time, the conversations about what's happening in Gaza. Um, in Israel, um, the, the conversation that's happening around Roe v. versus Wade, as well as the conversation about climate change. But the thing that I want to talk about specifically in relation to what I'm talking about is the other image about the new Underground Railroad, and in particular because this is a library. So uh, a few years ago, so I was at the University of Kentucky for about three years. I lived in Lexington. This was maybe 20... 15, 2016 to about 2019. And I got a chance to meet some Afro-Latin artists there. And one of them was Maria Co Cochran. And she was talking about her visit to the Smithsonian African American Museum. And she said she overheard someone say, quote, this time they won't be able to pack it up and put, a, put it away. This time they won't be able to pack it up and put it away. African American stories here in the United States. Now, I was reading recently, according to PEN America, there have been 1,477 instances of book banning affecting 874 titles. 30% include characters of color and or talk about race and racism. Texas has the most bans, followed by Florida. Now this, I got this last summer, so I think it's gone up since then, right? So when I go back to thinking about Maria Corcoran saying that at this time they won't be able to pack it up and put it away, I wanna say, but they're certainly giving it a good try, right? <laughs> Um, and what does that mean in terms of the stories that we tell? I think about the fact that this is the 29th, but we're still in Black History Month. And I have really mixed feelings about Black History Month for a lot of different reasons. But with respect to Carter G. Woodson, whose original intention was to bring attention to black presence on the landscape back in 1926, you know, what would he say about this current moment 100 years later when we're actually in some places we can't even have the conversation that you're having with me here today? Right? to understand how serious it is when certain stories get shut out and why that's happening. I also wrote here, um, so for about three years I was doing a column for the Earth Island Journal and I just finished that back in December, but one of the contracts, one of the pieces, I'm sorry, I wrote was, what would Harriet Tubman do? And I wrote, that, that's why I quoted her, and I said, if you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Um, and so I wanna think about what does that mean for us 
when we think about whose stories we tell, who gets to tell those stories, uh, how do we keep going and how are we supported to do it. Now, I know one of the things that the folks who invited me here today asked me to talk about was why I do what I do. Um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit because I always talk about that the personal is political. So this is the 10 year anniversary of Black Faces, White Spaces. It's also the 60th anniversary of both the Civil Rights Act and the Wilderness Act. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I want to talk about, I don't want to ignore, I never like to ignore, and I always feel bad when babies are crying. And, don't cry, little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the idea that the personal is political. So I want to talk about an article that was written in 2021. Isn't black representation what we wanted? The person who wrote it was a black writer named Mara Cheeks. And, she, and I keep looking at my notes because I'm quoting people. And I want to make sure I get this right. So in it, she had interviewed, one of the people that she quoted was the Jewish writer and thinker Fran Leibowitz. And Fran Leibowitz, I think, is brilliant and has been around a long time. She asked the question, Fran Leibowitz did, why does everyone want to see themselves in books? She was having a conversation with the great director Martin Scorsese and she kept saying she doesn't understand um, people who complain about not seeing themselves in books. She said, quote, a book is, supposed, is not supposed to be a mirror, it's supposed to be a door. Maura Cheeks, the woman who wrote the article, wrote in response, quote, I understand the sentiment but I disagree with the argument. It's the type of sentiment that can only be felt by someone who is unknowingly represented almost everywhere she turned. She didn't know what she had. A little bit later, Fran Leibowitz gets in conversation with the late, great Toni Morrison. And she says to, and Toni Morrison says to her, I am the reader of the books I write. And Fran Leibowitz says, your other readers aren't you. And Morrison just laughs and says, yes, they are. So I've been thinking about that in terms of representation. I've been thinking about whose stories are centered, who is centered, how we all frame our understanding, and where our bias comes into play. When I think about the environment, when I think about conservation, I think about that when we say names like Henry David Thoreau, and Aldo Leopold, and John Muir, and Rachel Carson, and it's not because I want to cancel them, I do not. It's not because I don't believe what they said is valid. I actually believe they said a lot of truth. And it's not, believe, it's not because I don't believe that they don't have something of value to say. But they're not the only ones. They are not the only ones, and a lot of what they were experiencing was in part because of who they were at a particular time. I'm not saying they didn't struggle, because I know Rachel Carson did, but I want to make the point that what happens to everybody else's experience at that same time when we value a certain group of experience in a particular way. So two years ago, I got a chance to go to Camp Denali in Alaska, and I'm getting a chance to go again this summer. <laughs> Sorry. So Camp Denali, for those of you who don't know it, is a high-end, low-impact camp in the middle of Denali National Park. The family has been running it for maybe 40 or 50 years. It's all of these lodges, and they try to make everything sustainable. So that's the low impact, the idea that they have a greenhouse. They grow most of the stuff that they feed people there. Um, the cabins are incredible. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Like, you're, you have a cabin, but it ain't like no cabin you've been in before. <laughs> okay. I walked in with the fireplace and the mosquito nets, and but everything was well thought out. You, were, you could be comfortable, but we can also be smart about how we are here on this landscape. The food was incredible. They take you on hikes every day. And so what they do, they invite uh, an author out for a week. They said, we, we fly you out here for a week. You spend time in the evening. You get to talk to the audience, the group of people who's paid a lot of money to come here and do this. I want you to know this is a picture from my own outhouse. <laughs> Everybody has their own outhouse with a little heart car in the door and you can see the peak. Yeah, it's really something. You've never been in an outhouse like that either. <laughs> the reason I'm telling you that story is because I, it was a long flight from Burlington. Burlington, Newark, Newark, Anchorage, overnight Anchorage, six hour bus ride and a small prop plane in. When I changed flight uh, planes in Newark, I had some time to get some walking around the airport. There's an electronic store. I go in. There's a young African American man. He's working behind the counter. And he just looked kind of bored, you know. And so I walked over, I'm like, hey, and then he kind of jumped up. He was lively, how you doing? And we just started talking the way that you do with somebody you don't know, it's good times. And finally he looks over at me, he goes, so where are you going? And I said, Alaska. And he went, you kind of did one of these, and he said, Alaska? Why are you going there? 
And I read between the lines. He's like, why are you going there? You're black and no black people. Are you going to be okay? It's the last one. You're going to be there. All these things. And I just leaned in. I did a real stage whisper. I said, I'm going to tell them about black people. <laughs> and he's like, good luck. Go ahead. Do your thing. Right. When I think back to what part of the reason why I do this, I'm also that young man. I understood exactly. I, mean, I tell it in a funny way, but I understood what that meant. I had those thoughts, actually. I mean, I've been in a lot of places in the world, but i got to tell you, when I'm traveling in particular here in the United States, I will go almost anywhere that I am invited, but of course I think about it. Will I be the only one? Will people be friendly? Will people be kind? Will they invite me in? Will they ignore me? Will they just want to take my picture? I have, you know, will they ask me about my hair? Will they want to touch me? Like, what's going to, what's going to happen, you know, when I go there? It doesn't stop me from going, but I understood what he meant. And actually, I want him to feel like he can also go anywhere, right? Um, I want him to feel like it's, you know, whatever he's reading about, whatever stories he sees, he sees himself in that as well. I wanted to put this picture, and I'm going to talk more about my parents in a minute, but this picture is in Floyd County in Virginia, which is, is part of Appalachia and the region. And this was maybe, I took this picture 10 years ago. We used to go every summer down there. I'm originally from New York, and I'll come back to that as well. But my... We went down to, uh, with my mother and father and my brothers, and as we drove in, we first stopped at a cemetery where all my mother's people are buried, and we kind of paid our respects. It was a cemetery, cemetery like any cemetery you might expect to see. And then we pulled up to this place, and I was like, what's happening right now? And there was a, a white farmer sitting on one of those really big tractors, and my father gets out of the car, and he goes over to the farmer, and the farmer's very friendly and nice, and they're having a conversation, and then my father said, come on, come on in. And what I come to understand is, you're seeing this patch here in the middle. This is where all my father's people are buried. And so it was land that used to be in my father's family. And, you know, things happen. It no longer is. And it hasn't been kept up. I mean, the man's left all the bodies there, whatever remains there you can see. But we couldn't go inside because of snakes. But for me, where my heart twisted was my father who was a proud man, he's an angry man, he's angry at the United States, he's been angry for all 92 years of his life, had to ask permission from anybody, but he had to ask for permission from a white man. I'm not saying that because a white man is bad, I'm saying that for my father it means something to be able to pay his respects to his family on the land that is no longer in that family. And he's doing it with a smile on his face and all of us going in and saying this. And I want to think about um, I talk about how do we attend to place. So part when I go back to what Mr. Stokely was saying about his mother and the idea of caring for place and caring for people and how do we tell a story that attends to place. Um, and part of it for me is that we have to be able to tell the whole story, no matter how it makes us feel. I think a lot about what it means to flip the script, right? And I, think, I have to think that for myself. Let me tell you, when I started writing Black Faces, White Spaces as a dissertation, so 2003, 2004, I'm in graduate school, I couldn't find a single story about black people environment on the library shelves except for environmental justice where something bad's happened to a community of black people. And like any people, we are not simply what the bad things that have happened to us. Where are the nature stories? Who are the adventure stories? Were the conservation stories. I mean, I knew that they were out there. And part of it was I wanted to be motivated by that, in part because I also did not see myself in any of those stories. As a human being, I can always relate to another human being. But what does it mean to actually have a very particular experience? Chris Buck is a photographer a number of years ago. He created a set of images, and I'm only going to put this one up here, where he called Flipping the Script. And it kind of speaks for itself. This is a young white girl. She's in a toy store. She's looking up at a wall of black dolls. There was another picture of a nail salon where people, women of Asian descent, were having pedicures done. And all the women doing their feet were of European descent. It's meant to really challenge what happens when you flip it. Is it the same story? Or does it have a different meaning? It's not about being better or worse. For me, it's just about being different. And how do we hold that? I love to talk about, this was my favorite show back in 2020, 2021. If you haven't seen the series, and, uh, HBO, uh, Lovecraft Country. It was based on the books of H.P. Lovecraft, who does a lot of weird fiction and science fiction. 
It's set in the 1950s. It was focused on an African-American family, in particular a young man who had just come back from fighting the Korean War. It was a working class, middle class family. But there's witches and monsters and everything involved in this story. And the, the first episode what really got me in terms of making my point here about what happens when you recenter the story. They start off with this young family who found out that they have to do a road trip to Massachusetts because they have relatives who are witches, so they're going to have to get on the road. They're packing up their car. The matriarch of the family can't join them because she has to stay back with some of the young kids. And she's kind of casually has a pad of paper going, running down the list, making sure they have everything. You've got everything you need. And what I realize she's doing is she's referencing the Green Book. Because it's the 1950s. So like any human being who's going to get excited about a road trip, who's going to get out there, do their thing, they're excited, all those things are happening, but also they're black, it's the 1950s. It's Jim Crow segregation, so it means. And it was almost a throwaway moment, but it gave some truth to the matter. A little bit later in their adventure, they are still driving, they're in Massachusetts. They get stopped by a white state trooper, it's a few minutes before sundown. He comes up to the car window and he says, do you know where you are? And they're like, no. And he says, you are about to enter a sundown county. So if you were here when the sun goes down, I can make no promises about what's going to happen to you. And then later you see they make it out and then they're fighting real monsters in the woods. But for me, it was the idea that they re-centered the story. You could still have an Indiana Jones type adventure because anybody, I believe, can have that. But if you're black at a very particular time in history, it's going to look a little bit different. And why can't we tell that story in that way? Yes, that's me. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know who Brian Stevenson is, I'm in love with the man. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Stevenson is a black civil rights lawyer. Uh, he works to get black men and teenagers off death row. He's been to the Supreme Court at least five times. He helped create the fabulous lynching exhibit that's in Alabama. Um, the man is like next level. So if they made a movie about him in Hollywood, True Justice with Michael B. Jordan, yes, also nice to look at. Um, the thing that I like to say about Brian Stevenson, I was watching his um, documentary probably 2021 around the same time. I watched extra, extra during the COVID days. Um, and I didn't know who he was before that. So I'm watching, I'm like, who is this guy? And they say, I realize we're the exact same age. We were born one day apart. We're both single, yeah. <laughs> and we both work all the time. And the interviewer asked him, why do you do what you do? And the first thing he said is, I do what I do because the system is broken. And I write it down, because I'm like, me too, the system is broken. And then he paused, and he said, well, I do what I do because people are broken. And I went, yeah, that's why people are broken. And then his voice got kind of soft, and he said, I do what I do because I'm broken too. And that laid me out. So part of this for me was a reminder that, and I love that he was able to say that out loud, that, you know, I'm broken too, right? I'm part of this larger collective of this larger collective of humanity that comes in there, and I need to be honest about what that is because that's where my bias lies. And I want to be really clear: bias is not the same as racism. It's not the same as prejudice. It's a point of view. It's a personal history, right? And if, for me, if you want to build trust, if you want to build a relationship, if you don't have to defend where you come from, you just got to be clear and understand where you come from and what that may, might mean in terms of how you move forward. Um, the other thing that I always think about is the question of how you move forward in right relation across your differences. And now it's probably been eight or nine years, I've probably told this story many, many times. But I was standing in the airport in San Francisco, and I was waiting to get on the plane. There was a Salvation woman standing in front of me. There was two um, women of European descent standing behind me. We're getting ready to get on. A flight attendant comes out, says you know, there's a delay. The four of us start talking, as you do, right? Everybody's really friendly. Um, somebody asked me what I do, and I started saying, well, I have these conversations about race, land, privilege, blah, blah, blah. The two um, women of European descent say, oh, that's so good. It's, isn't it so important to have empathy and sympathy? And I say, yes, and I'm agreeing. The South Asian woman hasn't said anything. And suddenly she speaks up, and she says, I've been to 75 countries. I go to businesses, and I talk to them about diversity. Empathy and sympathy are nice but who do you stand with? And I just, whoa, I wrote that down too. I got on the plane, I was like, yes, right? 
So for me, and many of you have heard this story, those of you who've heard me tell the story before, it's because I have to do it as part of the practice, is to talk a little bit about where I stand. Um, I put a different picture up here this time of my parents. So I have to start with my parents, Rose and Henry. This was taken in Floyd County. This was sometime in the 1950s. My parents grew up poor, big families. They grew up black, high school education. Um, my father went off to fight. They had both really big families, so they've known each other a really long time. My father went off to fight in the Korean War. When he came back from the Korean War, he had to get a job. He said he saw a park ranger in a park ranger uniform, and he thought that looked like a great government job. And as a veteran, it kind of seems like it would make sense. So when he went to apply in the state of Virginia, he said they told him, I'm sorry, but we don't hire Negroes. Um, my family and I together have never gone to a national park as a kid. So I'm going to just put that out there. But you know, the universe is funny, right? Anyway. So my parents joined the Great Migration. They moved north to New York, like a lot of black folks did. And they moved to New York because my father had a sister who was doing very well there. My father had two job offers. The first, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York, which is about five hours north of New York City. He didn't take that job. The job he took was 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County. A very wealthy Jewish family had 12 acres of land, and they needed people to care for it full time. And that's the job my parents took. So, there's a gardener's cottage that my parents lived in. There's another house you'll see an image in a moment. My father was the chauffeur, he was the gardener. Um, my mother was a sometime housekeeper and they lived here full time. My parents wanted to have kids. My mother thought she couldn't have kids. And the reason she thought she couldn't have kids, because like a lot of women who were poor, regardless of the color of your skin, she had gone into the hospital to have one, a cyst removed from one of her ovaries. But without asking her permission, they actually removed one of her ovaries. They told her that when she woke up, the reason we didn't ask your permission is because we didn't think you could emotionally handle the information. <laughs> so she thought she couldn't have kids and got very depressed. That um, opening slide, I can go back to later, was my mother's very opening slide when she first arrived here. The owners said, have you ever thought about adoption? And so actually, the owners of the estate arranged for me to be adopted. I was born in New York City, um, and they adopted me through Spence Chapin. And then what I always like to say, then my parents relaxed. I had my first brother. <laughs> and then they did more relaxing. <laughs> my second brother. <laughs> So we grew up on this estate. It was a very wealthy, all-white neighborhood. Harry Winston had property down the street. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer lived next door. Winkler Golf Club was around the corner. I just want you to get a sense of the wealth, of the wealth that was there. We were the only family of color until the 1990s when a Japanese-American woman moved in for a little while, and then she moved out. This is the house that the owners came to on weekends and holidays. There's a swimming pool. There was a pond. I had, we had such a privilege to play and be outside in nature in this place. I just want to say that. We all knew how to swim by the time we were seven. We had to with a 12 acre property with water on it. This is where I rode my bike for the first time. I played out in the woods the first time. All these things were fabulous. I made up games. The driveway was the Piranha River. And I mean, I can go on and on about all the games and good times we had on this property. And also, my parents didn't own it. And also, I tell the story of being nine and walking home from school. I went to a public school. I was right around the corner. There was always policemen patrolling this neighborhood because of the wealth. The white policeman stops me. He wants to know where I'm going. I give him the address and I point because it's right around the corner. And he just looks at me and says, oh, do you work there? I'm like, dude, I'm not. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was confused, and I said, no, I live there. And he thought about it, I guess, for a minute or two, and then he let me go home. I go home, I tell my parents, my father calls the police station, gives them hell, they never bother me and my brothers again. But for me, I have to think about the logics. What were the logics there? I was a little girl, nine years old, time of day, school bag. All the reasons that he might have stopped me to see if I needed help, if I knew where I was going, if I was OK. And for me, as an adult, I think something was out of place for him. What was I doing in this neighborhood, in this beautiful, um, this beautiful part of um, the Meredith, of this county? I want to jump ahead to the 1990s. So the patriarch who owned the land had died in the 60s. The matriarch was now sick. Now my parents have been caring for this land full time for 40 years. To the credit of the owner, um, 
she was sick. She wanted to try to keep my parents on this land. The property was worth, at the time, over $3 million. Property taxes alone were $125,000 a year. So she would have to pay for that in perpetuity because her parents didn't have that kind of money. Her grown children said, no, you can't do that. You have to sell the property. Then she thought about she bought a piece of land right next door. Maybe she could have a house built because she knew how much the land meant, particularly to my father. But the prospective buyer said he would only buy that, this property, if he could also buy that land too. So at the end of the day, she had a house built for them in Leesburg, Virginia. And the only reason, even though my father swore he was never going back to that state, that he went to Leesburg is because my youngest brother at this point is married with kids and settled there. I'm moving around too much, as is my other brother. So they moved to Leesburg, Virginia. I want to jump ahead. And it's what is really important for me to say that the owner, and I'm just careful, I used to say their names, and I just don't do that anymore. But, uh, the owner wanted my father by her bedside when she died. You know, power is complicated, but so is love. And so it's really important for me to say that and hold that in a particular way. She passes away. The new owner buys the property, asks my parents to stay on. They stay on until 2003. Now my parents have been carrying that for that land for nearly 50 years, full time. They leave. They have a lovely house in Virginia on a half acre of land. Uh, maybe six or seven years later, they get a copy of a letter. Uh, one of the neighbors had sent it, and they show me a copy of the letter. It's from the Westchester Land Trust. Letting everybody know that a conservation easement had now been placed on this piece of property, meaning that it would be protected in perpetuity. There were new people. People could live on the land, but they'd be taking care of this property. It talked about... Um, it talked about the animals that lived on the property, the trees that grew there, where it sat in the watershed, all the reasons why it needs to be protected. And I agreed with everything, right? I agreed with everything. I get to the end of the letter where the folks from the Westchester Land Trust thank the new owner for his conservation mindedness. There is nothing in the letter thanking my parents who had cared for that land for nearly 50 years full time, which meant just like that, they were gone from the environmental history. And this is when I was in grad school. This is when I was thinking about how many people in the history of the country have been rendered invisible, who aren't part of the story, their labor. And not just their labor, their love. The idea that if you work something and you can't love it, I think it's actually quite the opposite, right? Parents had a high school education. They knew more about that land than any before. So yes, I'm biased when it comes to thinking about what's invisible and what we see and what we don't see, and what we honor, and what we don't honor. And this doesn't make the people in the land trust bad people. That is just too easy. It's not about that for me at all. It's more about privilege and power. I think there's always a moment of convergence. You know? So I always put this image up there, and you can see for yourself you know, representations of slavery, of Japanese internment, of indigenous people being removed from the land, of the land being polluted, of Chinese people, Chinese descent working the railroad. But I always have him next to these images, the image of Gifford Pinchot with the mustache, who is the reason why we even talk about conservation and thinking about conservation as management of our resources. It's the reason why we have the Forest Service. It's the reason why we have Yale Forestry, which is kind of amazing. This was late 1800s. And then you have John Muir, father of conservation, having a conversation with President Roosevelt in 1903 in Yosemite on overhanging rock. And I imagine it's an incredible conversation. Because this is where that idea of national parks, protecting it, wilderness, all of those things, they start to think about how do we regulate that? How do we change our behavior and protect these wild places? The thing for me is, I want to know what else was going on at the same time. So 1862, I think one of our most important pieces of legislation, if not the most important, that changed the way we think about land and environment with the Homestead Act. And when that gun went off at midnight, for the most part, if you were of European descent, you could run out, you could put your stake down up and talk to 160 acres. If you stayed on it for five years, if you farmed, you built a house, that land was yours free and clear. And no matter how many times I say it, I'm like, that can't happen anywhere anymore. Free and clear, and land is never just about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. You have something to pass down. And it is about the right to say you belong. How many times have you heard somebody say, this is my land and I belong here? I've had family here for generations. 
how powerful that is, right? So three years later, Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved Africans are free, originally giving 400,000 acres of land until white plantation owners started talking and said, what have we done? We've just given people we had as our slaves 400,000 acres of land, and land is never just about land. It's about economic and political power. It is about legacy. It is about the right to say you belong, so we're going to take all that land back. I don't have to tell you anything else tonight <laughs> for us to start to understand the question, not just of land ownership, but the sense of belonging. Let's go back to that young man in Newark, wondering, can you go to Alaska and feel like you'll be welcome and that it'll be okay for you to be here? For me, there's a direct line about the right to be able to say you belong that. And oh, let's not forget, all this land was stolen. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> All this land was stolen. I'm not saying it to make you feel bad, but I am saying it to make you feel. We can't forget that because there's a whole lot of people who will never forget that and are still fighting for that. And for me, the question is, how do I show up to that? Right? How am I in right relationship with that? And what does that actually mean for me? I start off by talking about, you know, in the book, I very purposefully used Spike Lee movies as titles to my chapters, in part because I was challenged both as a doctoral student and doing research on this again and finding those black stories, but that didn't mean the black stories weren't there. There were artists writing, doing paintings, and there were musicians making stories about this. People were telling stories about their experience, and I love the way that Spike Lee did it. And for me, again, that we've been bamboozled because I think we think there's a one narrative. There's manifest destiny. There's European immigrants came over. There's manifest destiny. They built up the civilization. They did do that. And I am very careful. I am not here to denigrate European immigrants. Something like 60% of them died. Many of them didn't want to leave where they came from. I can't imagine what it was like, how heart-wrenching it must have been to leave the land that you loved originally and what a risk to come over and do that. But again, I have to ask the question, who had to be removed on that land for you to have that opportunity? And who's accountable to that? And who's responsible for that? And how do we tell that narrative really differently? Another chapter I like to talk about is the idea of jungle fever. And Spike Lee is talking about interracial relationships, but I'm talking about something a little bit different. Really how black people in this country, the stories we told collectively, sometimes directly, sometimes not so directly, about black people in nature. So you're wondering why, you may be wondering why I have LeBron James up here. So this is Vogue. It's the first time, 2010 I believe it was, that a black man had been put on the cover. The basketball star, LeBron James, the supermodel, Giselle Bündchen. A lot of black people got upset when they saw this. Because why is he like this? Why couldn't he be Alex Vogue? He could have been in a suit, you know. There's a lot of ways he could have been photographed. And then somebody uncovered this poster, which is from 1917. I want you to look right down to the color of her dress. Now, when people at Vogue say they didn't know anything about it, I don't believe it. But for me, it says a lot about what's in our consciousness. So, Think about the late 1800s, there were World's Fairs, and I think World's Fairs must have been really exciting for some people because it was about sharing ideas. What kind of you know, culture are we going to become? What new ideas do we have? And also, we put brown and black people on display in cages at them. I think about Odomania, who was a 19-year-old man from the Congo who was discovered. He was brought back to the United States of America. He was put on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. My favorite museum, first museum I ever went to. And then the museum officials decided not enough of the public will get to see him. So they moved him to the prime exhibit at the Bronx Zoo. We could stand here all night, all the stories of black and brown people that this has happened to. So if we jump ahead to the idea of thinking about our first African-American president, and I just, I'm not getting political here, I'm always political, never mind. <laughs> and the idea that, you know, those images we were seeing, the watermelon patches in front of the White House, Michelle Obama being called to me, this is not new, again, direct line, 
to understand. So I come back to this Vogue photo, and if they didn't know, shame on them. And if they did know, shame on them. Um, the Civil Rights, so I said that this was the 60th year of the Civil Rights Act and the Wilderness Act, which is pretty incredible. And one of the things I did was try to read a lot of that legislation when I was writing the book to try to understand, did anybody actually talk about the environment? The Wilderness Act, Howard Zanizer and his people were so committed to think about these wilderness areas as universal spaces we all should be able to go to and find that renewal and find that connection. I, one of the things that just broke my heart is that Howard Sennheiser died within weeks before the legislation was passed. And he had worked on it for so long. And you had all the folks who were working on the Civil Rights Act also talking about issues of equity. And what does that mean? It was a focus on black people and women. But really, it was what does it mean for all of us to be able to labor and appreciate it for who we are. The Wilderness Act doesn't really get at, I mean, it was written at a time, you know, before, while Jim Crow was still in place. They didn't really get at that. So the rights that didn't really talk about the environment and nature, but they were all kind of working on that thing in a particular way. The story that I discovered, because a friend of mine in grad school who's Canadian sent it to me. In 1960, there was a white professor named Dr. DeWolf who was at Boston College. He was friends with an African-American couple who wanted to take a break and go to a national park. And because it was 1960, they were African American, they said, well, let's not go here in the US, let's go over the border to Fundy Bay National Park in Canada. But he wrote the superintendent because they were going to be staying in these chalets right in the park, you know, just so that they would know this and they'd be okay. He said, listen, they're, they've got multiple degrees, they're well educated, well cultured. The fact that he had to say those things is problematic. But he said, I just want to make sure that you treat it with respect. He didn't hear anything right away, and when you do, when he did, I'm sorry, when, he came, when a letter came back to him, the superintendent said, I'm sorry, I can't make that promise because we have so many American visitors here. <laughs> the couple was Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King, who wanted to take a break from their civil rights work in order to find that respite right, in the parks that so many other people like Howard Zanis were saying anybody should be able to get. You know, wherever you go, there you are. I always say to myself, it doesn't matter how famous you are, how much money you have in your pocket, whether or not you're a little girl with a school bag that's obviously coming home from school, there will always be somebody in this country to challenge your right to be in a beautiful place. And just because you're going to a park or a beach or climbing a mountain, it doesn't change. Racism, prejudice, and bias do not change because you enter a beautiful outdoor space. Because you know what? Wherever we go, there we are. Right? And so how do we heal that relationship so that we feel somewhat different? I'm revved up now, I'm not even looking at my notes. What's happening? I, yeah, I like to talk a little bit about memory because one of the things that came up when I was doing this research was how many people, there's a kind of collective memory, the way we think about ourselves. So, you know, when I think about African Americans and the Tuskegee experiments and the kind of mistrust of the medical profession, for instance, but there's also individual memory. And so the story that I tell, because it's easiest for me to get it across to you, is 2005, I was living in Atlanta. I was supposedly writing up my dissertation. Um, and I got my parents to come visit me. So the thing that I know I've only mentioned briefly, my father, but his name is, full name was Henry Lee Finney. I didn't get along with Henry Lee Finney. He was old school, conservative, had very specific ideas about gender roles. I mean, man worked hard and made sure that we had food on the table and all those things, and he had a really hard life. But he always scared me, so even as a grown person in 2005, I was scared. My mother was a different story. So uh, I do want to say this about my father. In around 2000, he wanted to change the name Lee because he was sure it was after Robert E. Lee. He asked us, how do you do that? We said, these are the forms you have to fill out. So we changed it, so now his name is officially Henry X. <laughs> so they're coming to visit me in Atlanta. We're going to go to um, Dr. Martin Luther King National Historic Site. Some of you, I'm sure, have been there. It's on a street where people live. There's Ebenezer Baptist Church. There's the house Dr. King grew up in. There's a visitor center. We wander into the visitor center. My mom wanders off. And all the exhibit was about a feeling of what it must have been like in the 50s and 60s. All the posters, all the sounds coming over the loudspeakers, the police rioting, the dogs, a, a replica of the jail cell that Dr. King spent time in. You were just supposed to have a whole sensory overload. I'm staying with my dad in front of one of these. We're not a touchy-feely family, like, you know, 
I was little before Oprah, so we didn't have this kind of conversation. So I'm there, standing there next to my dad, and I'm grown. Can I, can I borrow your arm? Don't be scared. <laughs> and he just grabs my arm like this. And I got scared. And I looked over at him, and his face had completely blanched, and I thought my father was having a heart attack. I mean, it happened so fast, because it was unlike him to grab me, his face blanching, and then right after that, he starts to giggle. And that's what really freaked me out. <laughs> and he pointed, and what he pointed to was a sign that was part of the display, and the sign said, for whites only. He pointed to that sign, he said, I saw that sign, and for a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to be here. And he was grabbing my arm to get me out. And it was the first time I understood, and I've told the story hundreds of times, and every time I think about it, it's the first time I understood what that man had been carrying his entire life. And he was always presenting this strong, you know, element, but in that moment, and the first thing, the second thing, the first, the other, the second thing I thought the first thing he did was, like, I've got to get her out. Um, and I come to understand it. So that memory that's in ourselves, I actually believe we all have it in our DNA collectively, but also what we carry individually and how that then shows up in terms of how trauma is passed, passed down. <sighs> the baby in the bathtub. So I think a lot about, you know, I started off by saying, you know, that all this land is stolen, which I like to say a couple of times. Um, and, you know, there's this question about reparations, and that's a whole other conversation. But I read an article a couple of years ago by an indigenous, indigenous writer named David Truer, and it was in The Atlantic. And it was a wonderful um, article where he went on, he did his work history, he talked about his people, he talked about the land that they lived on, he's talked about what's happened over time. And by the time he got to the end of the article, he said, excuse me, my allergies are acting up. He said, yes, all the parkland should be given back to Native Americans to steward. Boom, done, we're done. My question is, you know, and what I took away from that is not, we can have a conversation about whether some of us agree and whether some of us don't, but I'm interested, are we even able to have the conversation, right? I work with a lot of predominantly white environmental organizations, in fact, privileged to do so, um, and I always say to them, you know, because many think, oh, so do you want to cancel us out? And I said, absolutely not. We need everybody on board. That cancel culture thing is really problematic. For me. <laughs> Don't want to do that at all. I said, but yeah, you know what? You got to do some. You got to look at that mission statement that was made 50 years ago. Because it wasn't made for people who look like me. You know. I always say, you don't have to throw out the baby in the bathwater, but you definitely need a new bathtub. <laughs> and it is so frustrating for me for institutions and organizations who have really good people with good intention to do good work, but don't want to make that change, right? Because it's hard, right? It's hard to do that. And where, the, where does that leave us if we don't do that? And, and I always talk about taking a risk in order to gain, right? And what do I mean by that? And I, you know, I think we're always willing to take a risk in order not to lose something, but it looks different when you're taking a risk that you might actually lose, but because you believe in something else. And the story I always like to tell is that um, it's been a few years now when Svetlana Lazievich won the Nobel Prize. She's from Belarus, and she had written a book on Chernobyl. And in order to tell that what she thought was true about that, she had to say some things about her people. Like she was hanging out some dirty laundry in order to make a case, because she didn't want that ever to happen again. And when she did that, a lot of people in her country were not happy with her at all. And she was on NPR and Michelle Martin was saying, you make a lot of people uncomfortable. And her response was so brilliant because she said, I love my people. I'm not interested in them being comfortable. I'm interested in them being better, right? And the risk that she had to take in order to do that. We're almost at the end. I want to come back to my parents. So this is the last day they were on the property. It was 2003. They're standing in front of a weeping cherry tree. So maybe 10, 15 years earlier, my father had given my mother that tree as an anniversary gift, which they couldn't obviously take with them. When they got to be his work, they bought another one just like it. Um, 2020, when with George Floyd's murder, with Christian Cooper walking to Central Park, with the opportunities that were afforded me to put certain conversations out there in the world in a particular way, 
I would say this gently and kindly and gratefully. A lot of white institutions and organizations and people were reaching out to me and other people of color. Can you come and do this? We'll pay you to do this. Can you write this? Can you do this? Let me tell you, when that door opened, I went right through. You know. And yes, we can have a conversation about the continuum, the people who really meant it and the people who really didn't. But I actually don't care. Because if you actually invite me in, I'm going to come in and do something with that, right? And some of those people were great. So the New York Botanical Gardens had reached out to me and said, you want to do a residency here for three weeks? What are you working on? Um, we'd love to support that. And somehow I started talking about this weeping cherry tree. And they said, you know, we're the New York Botanical Gardens. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I bet you we could get on that property, get a grafting of that tree, bring it back to the New York Botanical Gardens, and tell the story of your family. I was laid out. I was like, wow, it's happening right now. But it's, woo, go, do it. That's so exciting. So they set to building a relationship with the Westchester Land Trust, and they're brand new owners of the property now, so they were trying to make all that happen. Meanwhile, in 2019, I had given a talk at the Mount Film Festival in Telluride, and it's environmental films, and they had recently said, we're going to do more around social justice, so they invited a bunch of speakers like myself to come in. And that's its own incredible story. But I told a quick story for 20 minutes, whose story counts. You know, big stage, big images of my family. I told this to a lot of filmmakers and people in the audience, some I, and a lot of people I didn't meet. In 2020, I got a call from somebody named Irene Taylor. She's a wonderful Emmy Award winning white filmmaker who does documentaries. Who said, would you get on a Zoom call with me because I, HBO has commissioned me to do a documentary about trees. And what I want to do, if I talk about a tree, I want to talk about a real person associated with it. And I thought about that as I was watching your story and realized I didn't have a single story in there about anybody African American. Could you help me think about what that might be? And I said, yeah, I could do that. And because I'm a little jokester, I admit that when we got on Zoom, and Irene's really nice, she lives in Portland, Oregon, I said, well, if you're going to tell a story about black people in trees, yeah. yes, you might want to talk about lynching. And I just, you know, and I kind of smile, because I, I just wanted to sort of see what she'd say. I turn on, and she says, you're right. She goes, but I'm not the person to do that. And I said, and we're not just the bad things that happen to us. And so I told her the story about the tree. The next thing I know, she said, can I do it on your family? I said, yes. She says, can we film you returning to the estate and New York Botanical Gardens getting a graft thing? Like, the thing was turning into a thing. I was getting so excited, like, oh my god, this would be amazing for my parents. This would be amazing. So we're getting everybody on board. The president of the land trust is on board. The new owners were not responding, really. It, they weren't responding at all. And I hadn't reached out to them yet on purpose. Um, and I wrote a letter. I said, let me write to them. Just give me your address. Let me just write to their medical doctors, a husband and wife. And I wrote her a letter where I never uttered the word race once. I said black people and talked about my parents, but I said they didn't. She wrote me back in 20 minutes and said, we'd be honored to have you here to do that. Now, before we could arrange to get on the property, the land trust wanted to know exactly where the tree was, because they realized they didn't know. So I sent them this photo, and you can see it here next to the pink hydrangea. It's right near the gardener's cottage. And I was kind of surprised they didn't know. And that's when I understood that just because there's a conservation easement does not mean that everything is protected. Oh, wow. Right, I didn't know that, right? <laughs> Two weeks after I sent them this photo, this is what they sent me back. Oh, it had been cut down. Actually, everything had been cut down. The flower beds, the vegetable gardens, the tree, all of it was gone. I saw this picture, and I, for at least three days, I had that horrible pit in my stomach. I was angry. I was depressed. The filmmaker was devastated. The New York Botanical Gardens was devastated. Probably about the fourth and fifth day, I said, you know what? This is what always happens, so we need to tell this story because it's about erasure, and we have to talk about it. And then I started to feel a little better a couple of days later, and I said, what if we could get everybody on board to plant a new weeping cherry tree? It took a little doing, but we got everybody on board to, in July 2021, to go on the property. And instead, what they filmed was us planting a new weeping cherry tree. And the new owner was nervous. I think she was there, and she was really nervous, because I don't know what she thought I was going to come and be like, listen, she wasn't even going to cut the tree down, right? So I said, not at all. Um, and for me, the point is, is that everybody is accountable to the story. 
which is very different than appropriating the story that's not yours to appropriate, something we've done over time and we continue to do, whether we're writers, storytellers, teachers, politicians, we do it all the time. But if you're in right relationship, it's, this isn't just my story or my family's story, it's actually all of our stories. I need them to be responsible to it. I need them to be the ones remembering it too. Um, about a year later in 2022, they sent me a picture of the tree to let me know how the tree was doing. And what really got me was that the owners had taken it upon themselves to plant daffodils around the tree. And they didn't know that daffodils were my father's favorite flower. And so this is kind of where I want to end. There's always a lot more things I can say. Um, and, but I'm thinking about playing the long game. Um, some of you may have seen this painting because when Joe Biden was inaugurated, Senator Roy Blount gave him this painting as a gift. I was watching it on TV. It's called Landscape with a Rainbow. And I didn't really think anything about it because I often think a lot of pictures from that time kind of all look like this. <laughs> I, mean, I just said it, I know. No disrespect. <laughs> It was that when he said that it was an African-American painter who painted this in 1859. And the reason my ears perked up is because a black man painted a picture in 1859, so slavery was in place, of a landscape with a rainbow. And a rainbow is about possibility, it's about hope, all of those things. I can imagine what that man was carrying in his body. They said he had a lot of mental challenges, had to go over the border to Canada. I can't imagine what it must have been like to live as a quote unquote free man during the time when many black bodies weren't allowed to be free. And for me, what I like to say is that I think he was playing the long game. The last thing that I want to say is maybe a year and a half ago, Cornel West, the black philosopher and thinker came to Vermont and he was amazing, just his, his ability to talk about so many things with no notes, I was like, dang. But the question for me he asked right at the beginning of his talk is what kind of human being do you choose to be? He didn't ask you what, what kind of human being you are or you want to be, but who do you choose to be? And I was sitting there like, yes, yes, I choose to be kind and empathetic and you know, hopeful and all the positive things. I mean, all of us were coming out of the audience when it was over, and he did a book signing. Everybody was like, oh my God, we love you, I love you. You know, it was like, I said, I feel great. That's the kind of person I want to be. But the universe always decides to test me. And three days later, this is the email I got. Hi, I saw your racist book at, the, at a National Park Service Center today, and I made sure to put a normal non-racist book in front of your stack so that no one else would see your racist book. Please stop being racist. Our world depends on harmony, not disharmony, and racists like you. Stop being racist. White people are great. Signed, Sarah the Great. Now I have to tell you, all that empathy and kindness and everything I was feeling three days before was gone with the wind, <laughs> right? So what I want to, and it hurt, it actually hurts my feeling, I don't know, you know, I have pretty thin skin, I had friends of mine were laughing, they were like, but most people, I said, because it hurts, there's something in there, I know she didn't read the book, you know, I, I know that there's, she had all her own stuff going on, but it still hurts. Um, and Cornell had talked about that we all have crooked hearts to bear, right? And so what I wrote here, just to end it up, I say, you know, I just want to read it as I wrote it. Um, I don't believe it's about waiting till we've figured it all out or even come to some place of grace, and I'm still working on it with Sarah the Great, but I'm going to bring my crooked heart to bear. Um, yes, we may have lost a shared national narrative, but there's a difference between losing and letting go to make room for something greater. And yes, it will cost you something. It's going to cost me something too, but we're worth it. Thank you.
I'll repeat the question.
privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself, and we all have privilege. We just don't have the same privilege in the same way at the same time. Suddenly faced with, maybe for the first time, that you have to consider your lineage, that you have to consider the impact you and or your family have had before, that you have to consider actions that you took that were, you didn't mean to be thoughtless, but, it, but somebody else perceived it as that. That's huge. And I always want to say, and how are people supported to do that work? So part of the reason I think is people don't want to do that work because that's scary. Do you want to dig down in your own basement and do some serious internal upheaval there? How are we supported to do that? I think it's hard and I think it's painful. I think people misinterpret that they think it's about shame or they think it's about, I press too. <laughs> um, that, you know, I'm always careful that if I come into a room like this one, that I understand that I was invited, but also I'm not here to make anybody feel bad. And I think people are afraid of feeling bad. I think when I look at some of the rules that have been passed in Florida, that we can't have these conversations in schools, and then somebody, you know, I read somewhere somebody said, we don't want white children to feel bad. <laughs> now, when I'm my after Sarah the Great response first, like when I have that response first, it is, you know what, black and brown children have been feeling bad their whole lives. And then I take a breath. <laughs> And I say, I don't want them to feel bad either. I don't want anybody to feel bad. This isn't about being comfortable, but it's also not about feeling nice. It's about feeling a sense of who you are as a whole person. What I love to tell is if you've read A Color Purple, or you've seen the play, or you've seen the movie, right? About this young black girl, Celie, and one of the main characters was Mr., a black man who was domestically abusive to the women around him. He just was brutal. Right? And both in the book, and in the movie, and in the play, and I've seen them all. Right, You, you watch it when he finally gets his come up and, and he's kicked out of the community. I was talking about so much hate mail about that when Steven Spielberg's movie came out from black people. And it sent her into a depression for three years. Because the people she loved the most were like, why did you put her dirty laundry out there and start talking about black men like that? And so black men haven't been abusive as well to women. right? But she said they missed the point. If you read to the end of the story, they bring him back into the community. It was about until you do right. So you make the choice to do right, and then we bring you right back. And that's the redemption piece. And I think that, you know, my human in me understands, like, who wants to do anything that's really hard and it's risky, and you might lose people? What does it mean for that to happen? And that's, that's the whole point. You're probably going to lose something, but it's for something greater and bigger. It's not about the thing that's comfortable and that's easy. And how do you solve 400 years of treating a lot of people poorly? We've legislated it. We've commodified it. We still think it's OK. And we got to do things like have Black History Month, because that's the only way we know how to show up and make up for it, and that doesn't do it. Indigenous Peoples Month, Women's Month. I mean, I know what we're doing. But it is topical. It is not the heart work. It is not the deep down, oh my God, my gut hurts work. It does, it's, it, it, that's the thing. And I think people often don't want to do the work. And people are busy. Most humans have full lives and are dealing with their own kind of pain. I believe everybody is broken. Everybody is broken. Because we're human, and life is hard sometimes. We lose people in our lives. It happens to everybody every day, and I can understand why somebody might not want to do any more of that work. And if we are going to move forward with everything that's happening to the environment, everything that's happening in this country, we have to be willing to do the work and to show up for each other. That's the <laughs> Same time next week, I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Carolyn Finney, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I hope your mom will be a pity. She will. 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 She